Hello, in this video, I'm going to discuss growth hormone. Uh, what we are looking at in this video is essentially we are zooming in on the hypothalamus and pituitary right, right here within the brain. Um, so here, this is the hypothalamus, the infundibulum, the stalk, and the anterior and posterior pituitary gland. In order to initiate the release of growth hormone, this neuron here um, is actually representing a larger group of neurons within the arcuate nucleus, right? I have simplified it just to show you um, that there are neurons within the arcuate nucleus that are going to release a hormone called growth hormone releasing hormone. This releasing here indicates that this is a um, that this is a uh, tropic hormone, which is essentially going to trigger the release of something else from the anterior pituitary gland. And so we see here the exocytosis of growth hormone releasing hormone. And we see that this hormone is going to enter into the bloodstream here within the median eminence. Okay. The blood is going to carry growth hormone releasing hormone, GHRH, down to the second capillary bed within this portal system, which is present within the anterior pituitary gland. Okay. This growth hormone releasing hormone is going to bind to receptors which are present on only the target cells. So here, let us zoom in on these target cells. This blood is the same as this over here. And so into the capillary bed. So this here is one of the capillary vessels. Growth hormone releasing hormone is going to bind to receptors called growth hormone releasing hormone receptors. All right, lots of alphabet soup here. Um, and these are seven transmembrane G protein coupled receptors. That is, here we can see the G protein, which activates adenylyl or adenylate cyclase, which is going to create cyclic AMP, which activates protein kinase A which in this particular scenario is going to act as a transcription factor, therefore uh, increasing the expression, or that is the transcription, of particular genes. The gene that is being expressed in response to growth hormone releasing hormone is none other than growth hormone itself. Okay? So here we can see that transcription occurs in the nucleus, uh, translation out here within the cytoplasm, post-translational processing in the rough endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, and finally the Golgi apparatus is going to um, create vesicles, which are essentially lined up at the membrane um, of the cell, and they are just waiting for a stimulus to release the growth hormone, so this exocytosis here, out into the blood. Uh, and so in addition to activating uh, or, and creating cyclic AMP, growth hormone releasing hormone when it binds to its receptors, is also going to trigger the influx of additional calcium ions. In this case, the calcium ions are going to trigger the exocytosis of growth hormone into the blood. And as we can see over here, growth hormone is then going to travel through this second capillary bed and out into the general circulation of the body. As always, this hormone in this case, growth hormone, is going to circulate throughout the body in the bloodstream and essentially only bind to tissues that express the growth hormone receptor. Today, we're going to talk about three different tissues that express growth hormone receptors, growth hormone receptor. Uh, the first that we'll talk about is adipose tissues. These are adipocytes, so fat cells, and of course, they are storage uh, vessels for triglycerides. So here we can see a glycerol, here we can see individual fatty acids, again, stored as triglycerides within the adipose tissue. Okay. In response to growth hormone, the ligand binding to its receptor, the lipolysis, right, lipo, right, lipids, lysis, so the breakdown of these triglycerides is going to be stimulated. Okay. Essentially, growth hormone is um, going to be triggering the release of fatty acids into the bloodstream. Right, and therefore, the body's tissues can uh, have a ready source of energy uh, to take into their cells and ultimately use to fuel their cellular processes. Okay. The glycerol, on the other hand, is going to be sent ultimately to the liver. Okay. And so glycerol is taken into the hepatocytes, the liver cells, and that is where we see the next actions of growth hormone. 
once again, a growth hormone binds to its receptor, and it's going to trigger um, a series of effects within the hepatocytes or within these liver cells. Uh, first of all, it can uh, trigger gluconeogenesis, that is, the generation of new glucose. And so what is the substrate for this uh, new glucose? Well, some of it comes from glycerol. Okay, so there are enzymes within the hepatocytes that are going to take glycerol and they're going to convert it into glucose. So once again, glucose is um, making uh, energy, right? these different energy molecules, glucose, fatty acids, etc., cetera, um, available for other tissues of the body. So this can increase metabolism, increase activity of a series of tissues throughout the body just by liberating stored energy uh, reserves. So from our fat and ultimately um, adding more glucose. On um, the second um, function that I want to uh, emphasize within the liver is that growth hormone is going to stimulate the transcription, translation, the processing, and finally the release of yet another hormone into the blood. And so our story uh, now is going to continue and we're going to look at both growth hormone and a hormone that is stimulated to be released by growth hormone. And that is called insulin-like growth factor. One of the target tissues that expresses both growth hormone receptors as well as insulin-like growth factor 1 receptors is the skeletal muscles. So what you can see here is a little bit of bone epiphysis sticking out up here. So this might be the head of the femur. And here we can see um, you know, the femur as well. And so these might be the quadriceps femoris muscles. So um, individual cells, again, express both growth hormone and IGF-1 receptors. Um, just a note, both of these receptors are tyrosine kinase receptors. And so that is how they exert their action on this tissue. As we can see in this diagram, both uh, IGF-1 receptors and growth hormone receptors are going to trigger an influx of more amino acids. Okay, so amino acids that are circulating within the blood are going to be able to pass through these channels and ultimately enter the myocytes. Okay. IGF-1 is going to go one step further and it is going to induce more transcription of or transcription and translation of uh, myofibrils or sorry, myofilaments within the muscle cells. Um, and so actin and myosin, um, the main proteins that um, give rise to the protein uh, activity of the cell and therefore muscle contraction um, are going to be built using the amino acids that have just been taken out of the blood. One more target tissue that I want to discuss today um, is just responsive to IGF-1 as opposed to growth hormone as well. So ultimately, this is a secondary effect of growth hormone. Okay? Um, so here we can see a random bone. When IGF-1 binds to its receptor, it is going to trigger um, increased activity in both the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts. Remember that osteoblasts are the bone building cells, osteoclasts are the bone breaking down cells. Essentially, we need both of these in order to um, replace our bones. Um, and so, re re well, sorry, both replace and maintain our bones. Um, and so it's really a balance of the building and the breaking down that gives rise to stronger and stronger bones. Um, essentially, IGF-1 is going to trigger um, more um, kind of breakdown of the bone, therefore liberation of things like calcium and phosphate and proteins to go into the blood. Um, and osteoblast activity is also going to be increased and therefore it's going to be depositing a lot of additional substances within the bones, right? And essentially bring, building them back stronger and stronger. Okay. Um, osteoblasts are going to uh, not only be increasing the calcium and phosphate in the local area, um, wherever they are within the bone, um, but they're also going to be secreting a lot of proteoglycans and a lot of collagen 1, um, essentially to build this bone back stronger. And so they are going to be also um, kind of taking amino acids out of the blood, just like we just saw in the skeletal muscle. Also, IGF-1 um, increases the activity of chondroblasts. Uh, so chondroblasts um, are the cartilage building cells um, when you are growing. Um, so when you're a child into early adolescence, um, essentially these chondroblasts are building cartilage uh, between the diaphysis and the epiphysis of a long bone. Um, and they are essentially um, allowing your bone to grow in both directions. Um, so commonly these are called the growth plates. Again, they are just cartilage 
being built by chondroblasts. And so IGF-1 is responsible for increasing the activity of chondroblasts and therefore increasing um, a process called endochondral ossification. Okay, so essentially um, taking this cartilage and converting it into bone. Just like so many systems within the endocrine system, this uh, growth hormone and consequently IGF-1 um, regulatory mechanism is uh, maintained via negative feedback. And so essentially the more growth hormone releasing hormone is released, the more um, negative stimulus is going to be put on the release of more. Essentially we don't want more and more and more growth hormone releasing hormone. Right? We want to essentially maintain um, all of these processes that I have just um, discussed um, within, within a narrow range. Okay? So um, essentially, the more um, IGF-1 there is circulating within the blood, right? the, um, the more of that molecule is going to bind to IGF-1 receptors on those same growth hormone-releasing hormone cells within the arcuate nucleus. So this is uh, the presence of this uh, hormone is going to exert a negative stimulus and therefore growth hormone releasing hormone is going to be inhibited um, or the release is going to be inhibited. Uh, there is a further negative stimulus um, that is induced by the presence of IGF-1. Um, here we can see the IGF-1 is binding to a different color um, cell within the arcuate nucleus. Again, there are lots of these cells. It's not just one. I am just simplifying it by showing you only one. Okay. When IGF-1 binds to this cell within the arcuate nucleus, it is going to trigger the release of growth hormone inhibiting hormone, okay, so growth hormone inhibiting hormone, um, which is also called somatostatin, SST. Okay, here, once again, we can see um, that this molecule Right, we can use either name, is released into the first capillary bed within the portal system in the median eminence. Okay, and so it is going to flow down um, to the cells, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, so uh, IGF-1 induces the release of growth hormone inhibiting hormone and somatostatin. Also, we have um, cells that are located within the paraventricular nucleus, also within the amygdala, Right, so within this part of your brain that is responsible for um, kind of primal emotional states, these can also induce the release of growth hormone inhibiting hormone into the blood of the mediate eminence. So the somatostatin, also called growth hormone inhibiting hormone, is going to travel to the second capillary bed within the portal system in the anterior pituitary gland. It is going to bind to the same cells that growth hormone releasing hormone bound to. Okay, so here I have shown two different cells. In fact, these processes are happening in both of them. I just wanted to separate it out to show you that here, the target cells, which are called somatotrophs or sometimes called somatotrope with an E, um, they can be stimulated to release growth hormone, so a positive stimulus, or they can be inhibited. And so the inhibitory process essentially involves somatostatin traveling through the blood, binding to this uh, somatostatin receptor. This is going to induce a cyclic AMP mechanism. Okay, so the G protein activates adenylyl cyclase, makes cyclic AMP. And in this case, cyclic AMP is going to um, turn off or close these calcium channels. Remember that calcium here flowed into the cell and triggered the release of growth hormone into the blood. Here, less calcium is going to inhibit the release of growth hormone into the blood. Before I end today's video, I want to give you a little bit more information about what stimulates this process in the first place. Um, essentially, these uh, growth hormone releasing hormone cells within the arcuate nucleus are going to be triggered to release GHRH in response to additional amino acids within the blood. Okay. Um, arginine in particular um, is what is triggering the arcuate nucleus to release. Um, and so uh, as we discussed, amino acids are going to be essentially pulled out of the blood by the skeletal muscle as well as uh, by the bones, right? by the bone cells over here. Um, and so here's the problem 
too many amino acids, here's the solution. Amino acids are going to be released. Okay. Another stimulus is a decrease in glucose and fatty acids. Okay, so essentially the body is utilizing these energy reserves, which implies that it needs a little bit more. And so um, both fatty acids and glucose are going to be released by the adipocytes, right, the fat tissue, as well as the liver respectively. Um, also, if there is an increase in exercise, right, different types of um, like good stresses, I'm not saying that, you know, you're freaking out because you have a test coming up or anything like that, but like, you know, it, it's cold or something. Um, and so your body needs to liberate some of these um, energy reserves so that your body can uh, respond to that challenge. Um, also ghrelin. Um, so ghrelin is a hormone that we are going to talk about um, in another video at another time during the term. Um, ghrelin is released by your stomach. Um, and essentially it is um, telling your brain that your stomach is not full, that you are essentially um, hungry. Um, and so this um, liberation of glucose and fatty acids essentially helps your body to maintain its activity even in a fasting state. Okay. Um, other factors that are going to increase this entire process, um, norepinephrine. Okay, so noradrenaline it might be more familiar to you. Um, vasoactive intestinal peptide, um, which is a hormone that is released by your intestinal cells um, in response to more, um, more food coming into the intestines. And therefore, if you have just eaten, you're going to want to pull amino acids right, out of your blood and therefore um, deposit them and store them within your skeletal muscles right, and actually utilize um, that meal. Also, a thyroid hormone um, exerts a positive effect on the somatotrophs. Okay, so all of these factors up here are increasing growth hormone, releasing hormone release. Um, these are enhancing the effects of growth hormone, releasing hormone. Okay, so they're going to lead to even more growth hormone um, going into the blood and therefore um, liberating fatty acids liberating glucose, the creation of insulin-like growth factor, the building of more muscle, and the building of more bone. Thank you so much for watching this video today.